What's up guys, our September Patreon rewards are finally available. If you're interested in picking up a Full Art Brainstorm or Muldrotha the Gravetide, you can check out all the details at patreon.com slash it resolves. What's going on guys and welcome to another episode of the Crack a Pack series. I hope you all are doing exceptionally well today. I'm doing very, very well. It's been a very busy week, so I apologize if we've been a little lax on our content on Instagram and things like that, but we're doing the best we can to get back on track. Uh, it's just been a very, very hectic week, unfortunately, but we're keeping on track with the Crack a Packs and I'm really stoked about that. And today we are opening up excuse me, Core Set 2020, uh, which is obviously the newest set uh, in Magic's line of expansions. Uh, Throne of Eldraine will be coming out very, very soon, but uh, I actually really enjoyed this Core Set. I will say that. There were a lot of really, really nice cards in here. My um, One of my personal favorites was Yarok. Uh, only have pulled one, surprisingly. I've opened like three or four boxes, maybe even five now, of uh, Core Set 2020. Only gotten one Yarok, but... A uh, lot of really awesome legends and things like that in this set. Um, uh, of course, we're going to go through this as if it's a pack one, pick one scenario. So we will figure out what our draft round pick, first round draft pick would be. Uh, but this is a core set. So please do keep in mind the power level of the cards might be a little bit lower uh, than your average expansion set. So just keep that in mind as we're going through and we're evaluating some of these cards. That may be the case. So. Our first card here, Sage's Road Denizen, it's a 2-3 for 2 and a blue. Whenever another blue creature enters the battlefield under your control, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard. So, um, we talk about Mill fairly often, it, it tends to pop up from time to time, uh, and it's actually a really good strategy in Limited if you can pull it off. It's a very big if, but if you can, you only have 40 cards to go through versus 60 in Constructed, and so it actually makes it a lot easier uh, to kind of get through your opponent's deck and actually mill them out for the win. Uh, cards like this help you really get there. These, this is sort of your engine piece in this set. Uh, it is just a common, so you can generally pick up... I think I drafted this this deck, actually, uh, just to kind of experiment with it. I ended up with like six of these, which was insane, and probably more than you should play, but uh, just to kind of test the theory, uh, and it actually worked some of the time. It's a little less reliable, in my opinion, than a lot of other strategies. Generally, and especially a core set, you kind of just want to be as aggressive as possible. Uh, there are a lot of really solid archetypes in core set 2020. Uh, Mill is not necessarily a super well-supported archetype, but you can get those pieces. I don't think this is a first pick, I will say that, though. Uh, this is one of those things that if you happen to find it and you're already in blue, maybe you can kind of shift or tilt into it. Uh, but it's really not an ideal start. It's not something you super, super want to go for. Uh, Moment of Heroism is an instant for one and a white. Target creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains lifelink until the end of the turn. Uh, very simple combat trick, and a very good one at that. It's only two mana instant speed. You're getting a two, two boost, which is quite good. And lifelink is actually really nice in this set. There's a lot of things that synergize with it. Uh, Angelic Overseer, I believe, is the name of the card. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but it's a two, two that if you have 25 uh, life or more, becomes a four, four flyer. Uh, or there's the the epitaph of blood, whatever it is, the 4-4 four, four that anytime you gain life, your opponent loses one life. Like that kind of stuff synergizes really, really well with a card like this. And so if you find yourself in like the black-white kind of life gain, maybe even focused really hard on the vampire strategy, this is a pretty good combat trick. It's not amazing. I don't see it run very often, and I choose not to a lot of the time, but it's not bad. Uh, Vorst Claw. Uh, is a 7-7 seven, seven vanilla creature for 4 and 2 green. So, uh, surprisingly not bad in this set. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a lot of, because it's an elemental. Uh, elementals are huge in this set, specifically in the teamer colors. Uh, and normally you can kind of pick two and then maybe splash the third uh, out of the out of those three options. Uh, if you happen to be in green, this is not a bad finisher. Uh, and honestly, just in any green deck, it's really not bad. It's slightly above your average stat of like a 6-6 six, six for 6. Uh, and so you can kind of value it a little bit higher for that. Uh, and then if you happen to have some elemental synergies, it's actually quite good. I do think so far it's the pick, though I really hope it's not our first pick. Uh, but definitely later in the pack, mid to late pack, if you pick up one of these, you're going to be pretty happy to have it. 
Uh, Stone Golem is a 4-4 vanilla artifact creature for 5 of any color. Uh, there is kind of an artifact sub-theme a little bit. It's not great, and it's not huge uh, by any means, and I, it's never something that I've found to be very strong. Uh, there's uh, a card that lets you pull out a couple of like equipments and things like that, which is really nice. We may see it later. It's a 1-3 blue creature, uh, and it's fine. It lets you pull out those artifacts, and it's nice to be able to play uh, things like this off of that card because it helps you ramp into them as well. But I'd rather have that card first. This is really just like, eh, it's fine. It's like a mid-game play for that deck, but it's not really that great. Uh, Silverback Shaman is a 5-4 for 3 and 2 green with Trample, which is awesome. And then when it dies, you draw a card. So also very, very good. Uh, I found this card to be a really, really solid 5-drop. Uh, generally speaking, it trades off pretty quickly. Uh, but you're going to be ideally uh, very aggressive with a card like this. That way, even if they do block it to kill it, uh, you can hopefully get through some damage with that trample. And then even when it dies, you just draw a card. Uh, and so I actually really like this card. I think it's better than Vorse Claw in general. Uh, again, really not hoping to first pick this, but it's not bad. Uh, Battalion Foot Soldier is a 2-2 for 2 and a white. When it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for any number of card names. Battalion Foot Soldier, reveal them, put them into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So this is very similar to cards that we've seen in the past uh, that just, uh, what is it, Legion Conquistador, I think, was in Ixalan. Uh, things like that that help you pull out other cards with the same name. Not only does that thin your deck, but it also just gives you uh, a number of plays for the next few turns, assuming you can pull out more than one. Uh, and so I actually don't mind this card, but I will say, out of all the times that I've drafted it, I've never actually played it. Uh, I've seen it played a couple times, and I don't think it's terrible, but it's still a 2-2 two -two for 3. Uh, and yeah, it's great. I mean, you got more plays for sure, but ideally you want to be moving up in the food chain, not just playing 2-2s. Two and so I found this to be a little underwhelming. Uh, I found that there are better picks, better plays out there, and so I tend not to play it. Uh, Winged Words is a sorcery for two and a blue. Uh, it does cost one less to cast if you control a creature with flying, and you just simply draw two cards. Um, honestly, this card is perfectly fine uh, in any deck that's running blue. It's obviously a little better if you do have a creature with flying, and that's the ideal situation for only two mana, drawing two cards. Very, very good. Very great card advantage. Uh, however, uh, a lot of times I've seen that this just ends up getting cast for three. It's still perfectly fine, still giving you that card advantage, just a little bit less efficiently. Uh, but it's not bad. I don't think it's a first pick by any means. A lot of times card draw tends not to be a great first pick. Uh, ideally, you want to be established in the color uh, before you pick up something like this. However, uh, it's not a bad card. It's something that mid-pack I definitely would be interested in if I'm in blue, uh, but I'd rather pick some threat first if I can to help define me just a little bit. You don't want to get pigeonholed by any means, but you really want to find some reason to pick up future cards versus just something like this. Uh, Unholy Indenture uh, is an enchant creature for two and a black. When the enchanted creature dies, return it to the battlefield under your control with a 1-1 one, one counter on it. Um, I tend not to play this card, I will just go ahead and say. Uh, that being said, though, there are a lot of times where I've seen this uh, do some really, really great work, uh, especially with things like Death Touchers. Uh, you block, you get a counter on it when it comes back, and you just have now another Death Toucher. And that's really, really good to be trading up. Uh, it's always really, really nice to be doing that. Now, of course, you're kind of two for one a little bit. Uh, you you kind of lose two cards at first, but you get one of those cards back, and so it's actually kind of evening out in the long run. Uh, but I, it's not a first pick, in my opinion. I feel like this is a card that you pick... If you just really need that three drop slot to fill out to fill out just a little bit, and you have to be fairly creature heavy, uh, just because you know if you don't have a creature out there, this does absolutely nothing in your hand. And so you want to be creature heavy. Maybe in that vampire strategy, this is fine. Uh, but in general, I don't think it's a very good early pick by any means. Uh, and so not super excited by it. Uh, Griffin Sentinel is a 1-3 for 2 and a white with flying and vigilance, so it does not have to tap when you attack with it. Uh, I've actually found this to be very good. Uh, I don't think it's an amazing card by any means, but it usually survives quite a while, uh, which allows you to not only ping in the air, but then also block because of that vigilance. Uh, and because there are so many flyers, blue-white flyers is more of an archetype in this set than it has been in a lot of previous sets. 
Uh, and because of that, it's really, really nice, not, well, for you, if you happen to be in that strategy, obviously, this is great, uh, but also to block that strategy a little bit if you find yourself up against it. It's really nice to have something in the air that can not only represent kind of a threat, uh, but also be a blocker for you just in the long run. And so I do like this card quite a lot. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily better uh, than the, the Silverback Shaman. Uh, I don't think either one's necessarily first pickable, though, either, to be honest. So I'm going to keep them together for now. We'll see what we get. Well, okay. Uh, Howling Giant uh, is 5 and 2 green for a 5-5. Five, five. It does have reach, so it can block things with flying. Uh, and when it enters the battlefield, you create two 2-2 two, two green wolf creature tokens. So uh, you're actually getting 9 power and 9 toughness for, for the low, low price of only 7 mana. Uh, which is really good. And for the fact that this has reach, that's awesome. Uh, like I said, green white or excuse me, blue white flyers is very, very popular in this set because there are there's not only a lord for it, but it's also a little bit more pushed than it has been in the past. Something like this helps you stay alive in a very ground heavy green deck. Uh, and it it represents a very, very huge, very, very real threat. Uh, and so, honestly, this is a great first pick. Uh, we'll see what the rest of the pack holds, but I actually really like this card. Uh, Cryptic Caves is a land that taps for a generic mana, then you can pay one and tap it, sacrifice it, and draw a card. Activate this ability only if you control five or more lands. I don't love this card, personally. Uh, I do think it's per uh, it's fine to run in like a one to two color deck. If you find yourself in more than that, probably not worth it just for your mana cons uh, constrictions. You don't want to find yourself in a situation where you do not have the fixing that you need. Uh, and while this does long term ideally draw you a card, it's not fixing you in any way. So it's not actually getting you the colors you need. It's just a land, uh, just a generic land. Uh, and so just keep that in mind. That's a very uh, this is one of those considerable picks when you know what the archetype you're already established in uh, has, you know, you've already got that established a little bit more. And so uh, if you don't know, I don't think this is a very good early pick at all. Uh, Diamond Knight is a 1-1 one, one for three of any color. It does have vigilance as well. And then when it enters the battlefield, you choose a gutler. Uh, and whenever you cast a spell of that color, you actually put a 1-1 one, one counter on the Diamond Knight. Uh, I found this to be a very, very uh, solid three drop. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to really get going, but if you find yourself, especially even in a one to two color deck, especially one color, obviously, but if you find yourself in a two color deck, you can generally find yourself favoring a one color just a little bit more. Uh, and so nine times out of 10, you're going to want to play uh, Diamond Knight and choose that color and then hopefully be able to very quickly boost it up in, in its stats and then swing in uh, and obviously leave it on blocks because of that vigilance. And so I actually really like this card. I love that it fits into any deck as well. Uh, it is three mana of any color, so it's really nice and flexible for that reason. I think I'm going to keep them together for now, the two cards I have pulled out, and we'll see what our rare is. It is Leyline of Anticipation. It's an enchantment for two and two blue. Uh, if it is in your opening hand, you can begin the game with it on the battlefield, so you don't even have to pay for it if that's the case. And you can cast spells as though they had flash. So this is a really, uh, I think, interesting card and very tough to evaluate card, I will say. Uh, obviously, it's really great to be able to play things at flash or instant speed. Uh, it's awesome to be able to, to lay this out on the battlefield. Your opponent probably won't have much enchantment removal, uh, at least main decked. And so what you can do, lay this out, hopefully, uh, and then be able to play things at instant speed, never have to play anything on your turn, and just surprise them with creatures as, as, as often as you'd like to. Uh, and that's awesome. That's really, really good. Uh, but that's very much the dream hand with something like this. Uh, it's very easy with the London Mulligan rule to, to favor that because it's easier to kind of get down to, to the cards that you really need. Uh, but you obviously in limited don't want to go down too far uh, in any style of play, to be honest, but limited in particular, because ideally you want to be playing something every single turn. And if you just don't have cards to play, you're going to lose the game. I mean, that's just the reality. And so you really don't want to mulligan too heavily uh, even if you do have a card like this in your deck. And so I tend not to be too excited by a ley line. Uh, in my opinion, I just think they're fine. They're not amazing. Uh, I don't think I would first pick it here. We do have a foil uh, Veil of Summer. It's an instant for one green. Draw a card if an opponent has cast a blue or black spell this turn. Uh, spells you control can't be countered this turn, and you and permanents you control gain hexproof from blue and black until the end of the turn. 
Uh, this is a very good sideboard card. Realistically, you would never mainboard this because you have no clue what color deck you're going to be up against, and so it's not good to main deck a card like this. Uh, it's okay uh, against a blue or black deck. Uh, it's it's exactly the kind of thing you obviously want to play this uh, against. But other than that, not super exciting and definitely not the pick. We do have a Jungle Hollow as well, which is a green-black duel. It does enter the battlefield tapped, but you do gain a life. Uh, and that life gain, again, has a lot of synergies in this set. So uh, a dual lands always. Pick them up if you're in those colors. If you're not, it's probably not worth it unless you're considering a splash. Uh, in which case, maybe take this just to make that splash a little bit easier for you. Uh, if you find a really powerful card that you'll want to splash, it's worth picking these up for sure. Um, to me, it's between Diamond Knight and Howling Giant. Um, honestly, on raw power level alone, I think I would go for Howling Giant. It solidifies you a little bit more into the token strategy, uh, which is perfectly fine with me. That's a very easy uh, kind of strategy to pull off. There's a lot of token generators in this set. Uh, and it's a really, really good top end card. So uh, that's just my opinion. Feel free to disagree in the comment section below. As always, I am very, very happy to have that conversation. But if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave a like or a comment down below. And as always, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. But with that, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next Crack-A-Pack episode.